G'day, g'day, and welcome back to another episode of A Lot to Talk About. It is your boy, the captain of the ship, the man in charge, Bradley J. Drabra. You can call me Brad or the captain. No one does, but we're trying to get it going. It's a self-proclaimed nickname that sounds pretty cool and has no reason behind it. So here we are. I'm excited to be back for another show. Today's episode, the 91st, but officially episode 090, with an incredible guest, a guest that I've watched through my screen for many years and laughed at um, on many occasions. I would say he's the star of Angry Dad. However, he calls himself the victim. Um, He has an incredibly inspiring story, which I believe will be um, of great relevance to so many listening and viewing here today. Um, And all of you will, will get, I get a little bit touched by a guy that you didn't know had so much of a story behind him. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, from your home, your car or wherever you are, give a very warm welcome to the one, the only Mr. Mark, Angry Dad Orville. How are you, mate? G'day, Brad. Jesus, what an intro, mate. Not only do you sound like you're meant for radio, <clears throat> we're on Zoom so I can see you and I can tell you got a good head for radio too, mate. <laughs> mate, you sound, you sound like, um, you sound like my old man. My mum would say nicer things, but... <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you got to earn that. you got to earn that, Brad. I was taught to earn it, so you got to earn it, mate. Now, good intro and pleasure to have a chat, mate. Mate, I really appreciate you being here. It was um, it's brought to my attention about a week or two ago. I was sitting down chatting to a friend on the phone and she recommended that I listen to a, a podcast, a couple of girls from yep. the coast, and I tuned in and the episode she actually flicked me was yourself and your son, Mitchell, and and I was quite interested because for, like I said, for many years, I'd watched your content across Facebook and Instagram. And, you know, my sister and I always found it incredibly funny because our dad's quite similar to you, um, loves to get flared up and, and, you know, we have a laugh about it and take the piss, which I know you and your family are much the same. And watching the content, you come across as a very humorous guy and hearing then your story in depth and, and getting to know who the person was behind the laughs was really interesting to me. It was quite a contrast and you shocked me a bit, mate. You shocked me. There was a lot of depth in the conversation. It was quite emotional. And I walked as I was listening to this and I thought I've got to have this guy on my podcast to have a chat because um, in many ways, your story is different to mine, but there are some similarities with health battles um, and personally yours within the mind. And um, it's a pleasure to have you on here to discuss that. And I want to make sure that everyone listening and viewing today gets to know who not angry dad is, but who Mark Orville is. So if you can give us, I guess, the beginnings of the story, talk to us about, you know, we're speaking here, you're in Melbourne at the moment. You said you can't wait to get up to the coast. When did you move to Melbourne and why? I've been in Melbourne since I was 16. Um, the, The journey pretty much involved country kid that had been to Melbourne once before in their life only, once only, and got drafted by Collingwood to come down here and give the, the old big league a crack. So <clears throat> that was 85. Yeah. So I was 16 and I've pretty much, well, I've been here ever since. I never went home. You know, the whole footy journey thing didn't happen um, the way it was planned, but it is what it is. Um, that's just life, I guess. Mate, I, I grew up on rugby league. So I grew up on the, you know, slightly different game but understand very much with a lot of mates who love their AFL and and love their Aussie rules that um, it is a game so many here in Australia are passionate about and I watched a few of your highlights this morning and and went back and watched a bit of that stuff for reference and mate you're a great player and and you look like you had all the skills and hearing you speak about it in the trailer for your documentary you know I related to that I, I grew up with a massive passion and a love for rugby league. And I wanted to be the next Brad Fittler. That was my dream as a kid, but um, a little different to you where my dream was taken away as a child before I had the chance to step into a stadium. And, and, you know, I can imagine once you step into a stadium or you play on an MCG or you've got the fans and you're wearing a Jersey that you've grown up watching other men run around in that even becomes more emotional. You become more attached um, my dream was taken away to, from me due to liver disease. Um, my liver went below my, my rib cage, so I wasn't protected when I played league anymore. Um, but for you, your, in, your dream ended with an injury, right? Yeah, it was. So, you know, at the end of the day, that whole um, 
first, sort of first game experiencing, you know, you look back on it, it was a reward for effort. You know, you, you made, you clearly had some ability that was picked up by the club and then you make that commitment and that move to Melbourne, you leave family and, and you actually start a whole new chapter. And, you know, I'll, I'll never forget the first sort of, the first game and not just being sort of told I was playing, but I was actually, I lived with um, Chris Siska and McGuan um, and a couple other guys um, at that point. And they were actually playing reserves the day that I'd actually got chosen to play my first senior game. So I'm home on my own and we were pretty much just on the other side of Hoddle Street um, from the ground. So it was walking distance. And I remember just running up and down the corridor, bouncing the ball, saying to myself, you know, this is what you wanted. You've finally got an opportunity. Now just make the most of it and just make it count. So again, I know exactly what clothes I had on and everything. So it's a, it's a memory that's um, very well um, etched in the mind. Yeah. I love hearing that. Those stories are always really nice to look back on. And, and like you said, a very fond memory of yours. Talk me through how much time you had in the Collingwood Jersey. Was it, you know, obviously injury plagued it, but did you get through a season? Did you get through a few or? No, I went, I went there in 85 and, and did my apprenticeship again at 16. It's the under 19s, which is that sort of that platform that they provide to see if you can actually then make it through to reserves. So Played um, some reserves games in 86, um, but sort of 87. Um, I had some issues 86 with my foot and just persevered with it. But looking back, you know, again, it was the silliest thing I could have done. But so reserves again, 87, and then was fortunate enough to play the last uh, six out of seven games at the end of 87. I got suspended for one game, Jimmy Steins and I had a bit of a, a tussle and I got a week, he got off, but he, he well and truly whacked me a few times, Jimmy. And we yeah. laughed about it often, actually, whenever we caught up at different times or bumped into each other. But And then pretty much the nightmare started, Brad. Um, first operation after the last game where I just knew that there's just issues there and I was sick to death of sort of putting up with them and persevering with them and listening to the story and that it was something else. When in fact, finally, they detected that it was actually a stress fracture. And that's typically, especially these days, not a big issue because um, they, they get you off your feet and, and you go in and um, uh, you know, potentially have a cleanup or surgery. But mine was that bad, I need to pin put straight in. So I've pretty much been playing with a broken foot, as it turns out, for two years. Mm. And that's the sad thing in all this. But again, it was like, okay... We found it, wow, we now understand. Let's just put a pin in and let's fix it and then we move on. And that seemed quite sort of simple and, and, and easy to do. And, you know, you're, you're 18, so you just go, okay, let's let's do it, which is fine. I mean, there's no other way I, I could have approached it back then, given how, how it was. But um, then what happened was the first, uh, the first surgery, which involved a dirty big, screw you know nearly as big as my finger i've still got it I, i've still got it as part of my collection of shit but and it went in too far basically and mm. that's when all the issues started so you're talking about an avicular stress fracture right so an avicular bone is yay big and you know you put a dirty big screw through it and then you're going to pull a bastard out there's a huge hole and you've got to then try and put another one in that um, can do the same job and fill up the bone and all this sort of, and it just never recovered. The, the, the simple fact was it never recovered to the yeah. point that, you know, fast forward four years later and it was nine, 10, 11 operations. I had to have my whole oh. foot fused. So my whole foot fused, it was the only way that eventually they could deal with it. Cause I, I continued to try and play it from you know, end of 87 to 91 but uh, you would build up and the, the minute you got to sort of game time um, and you're twisting, turning, you know, under unpredictable situations, et cetera, it would just shatter and, and snap and, and, and crack open again. Mm. So I only ever played one senior game after that 87 at the end of 88. Um, and then 88 to end of 91, I probably, I would have been lucky to play three reserves games. I reckon I'd, I'd come back and try and just bang again. Yeah. But um again yeah and look that's the devastating thing isn't it because when it's it's hard when you know that it's probably over 
at the end of the day, it's you that has to make the decision in many cases. Talk me through that decision to walk away from the game you loved and the game you grew up uh, with. It was, it, it was mutual, right? I had so much respect for Lee Matthews at the time, who was a coach. And, you know, I'd watch them deliver the flag in 1990. Um, so I was there part of it. And um, I suppose, again, fond memories of that whole, that whole team, that whole experience that I was lucky enough to share. But at 91, it was really just, we looked at each other in the eye basically and said, you know, I'm pretty much a list clogger at the moment. I'm, I'm, I'm taking up a spot that some young kid could be sort of having and it's never going to get better. It's, it's rooted now. It's, you know, I'm going to probably struggle to be able to walk properly and play golf and that sort of shit, let alone play AFL footy at the highest level. So yeah, we just pretty much shook hands and walked away at the end of 91 and, Again, it's like one chapter closes and you then become normal, so to speak, and that whole dream of yours is just come to a, a sudden end. Talk me through that because that transition from athlete to what you'd call civilian, um, there's no really other way to describe it, is it's, it's really challenging for most. And there's very few that I think do it well. I think especially in a world now, like modern day, back then, if, if they had the technology they have now and the media coverage they have now, I can imagine that you probably would have been sitting in a broadcast booth somewhere um, with your talents and, and your humor. However, back then, there wasn't too many options like that. What did the field look like for you moving away from the sport? It was probably my own fault because I just had a grudge on the whole world at that point. And, and really, again, I've actually reflected a few times on this and thought, why didn't I stay involved? Because I had something to offer and I loved it and this, that and the other. But this, it's a mindset thing. My, my mind couldn't deal with being around footy and that sport if I wasn't actually participating and playing. You know, I would, I would hope every week after I left that Collingwood got flogged. That's just how I was. I'd watch the tally, I'd watch a game, whatever, and say, oh, these bastards get flogged, which is really sad when you think about it because it's, no, it, it, it's none of the players or your, or, or, or your other mates there. and all. It's, none, it's none of their fault. There was, you know, there was people to blame, was my view, but what's blame going to do when the door's already closed? Yeah. But it's too late now, Brad. Um, it would, I, I, of, of course, I, I, I've always had a... Uh, a dream that I was actually on radio, believe it or not. That was from when I worked back at the local radio station when I was 15. Yeah, wow. So how, how ironic and crazy is that? It's funny how the, the way the world works, isn't it? And it all comes full circle in the end. Obviously, you've been more outspoken in the last year in particular on something that you kept private for a long time, your mental health battle and... I can imagine, like I said, that transition is really hard walking away from a dream and something you love. When did you start to recognize that, you know, obviously you spoke there about the resentment for the, the game and also for the club after leaving and knowing that so many things were out of your control. However, when did you start to recognize there were things there mentally that needed to be addressed um, with your health? It was probably a couple of years after I left. I sort of finished at 20, that sort of 20. 223 so it's about 20 about 25 but it was pretty easy at that point to sort of look back and say that you know the, the way I was feeling um, some of my actions then were underpinned by something that was going on right it was sort of almost anger and the like that was not normal right and I was, there's so many things I was not proud of at that point you know I would go out and I was with Sharon back then even in 80 since, since 88 I would go out and there wouldn't be a Saturday night when I wasn't involved in a blue. It was as simple as that. Yeah. And, and I know it was because I would look for it. It was just, that was the way that I was dealing with it. You know, you turn to alcohol and partying and this sort of shit. And there's no winners in, in any of that. So yeah. I think it was like, we just had Dylan or just before Dylan, I was 25. You know, there, there was pretty much some, some ultimatums during that sort of period from Sharon to say you need to you need to go and see someone and get some help and start to understand what's going on etc and that was the best thing I ever did um, because if I didn't you know then she would have gone for a start and then you know what happens there that that whole evolution that we've seen 
just wouldn't have actually happened. It would have been the sliding doors moment. And who knows where I would have been now. But um, that was hard to do because it was about self-assessment and, and sort of an admission, basically, that you've got yeah. a problem and an issue. But if I, again, without it, I don't, I don't think that I would have got through. I, and in fact, I know I wouldn't have got through um, because it's not, it, 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 for those that have gone through it and know it and understand it, it's not something that's easy to actually manage and deal with, with or without medication, right? Because it's, the, it's more than that around, you know, how you need to try and train your brain to, to think and feel because how you, how, how you think ultimately drives how you feel, you know, that yeah. positive versus negative and, and the like. So, well, it was a long, long journey, let me tell you. And probably you know, nearly 15 years and, and, and some horrific, horrific times in that 15 years. And, and, and these times, you know, and I, I mentioned in the, in the doco, my best mates and people that I've known for 30 odd years had no idea about any of this. But I wrote them all a text um, before the doco and actually said to them, I hope now that this helps explain some of my actions over yeah. many, many years. It doesn't justify them, but it helps explain them. And my messages from some of the people I was close to, I was so blown away with in terms of how they actually reacted to it and how they looked. Because it, it, it was a flashback to them as well. Yeah. And it all made sense. And they said, you know, why didn't you reach out? Why didn't you talk more? And you know what? It's because men don't talk about this shit. That's no. why. That's and exactly why. I was, he was hidden. Sharon, my mum, my dad to a less, lesser extent because he sort of, you know, just kept out of ship. But it was pretty much my mum, um, uh, uh, Sharon, and, and later on Sharon's dad pretty much that, that understood the, the whole scenario and what I was going through and what I was dealing with. I've got to say, Mark, you said there that men don't talk about these things. And I think that is 100% truth in today's age, right? Where we're actually, believe it or not, getting better. Where I can imagine back then, you know, what it would have felt. It would have felt like being a real outcast to talk about it because, you know, I speak to my old man right now about the world that we live in and, and this landscape with mental health that is changing. And back then he said, nobody really spoke about any of that. And I can imagine it would have felt so foreign to open up about those sort of things. So you can imagine why so many kept it in. And I can understand why someone like yes. yourself, especially from the footy culture, which is that, you know, that typical old cliche of That's men a bravado. Up, yeah, of course. hundred yeah. percent. So you're doing a lot of work now to make sure that men do feel comfortable speaking up and, and just everyone feels comfortable sharing their feelings and having a conversation with someone for yourself, what has been, I guess, has it been support groups? Has it been family, personal, or just close one-on-one -on -one relationships that have been the best way to open up? Like, what are your experiences uh, look, with that? It, it's, well, you know, I, I hadn't opened up about it until the doco last year, which I started the August the year before. So um, it, it's, you know, it, I think it's, it's the professional help that I sought um, that actually just helps you actually eventually learn to deal with it. Because the reality is you can deal with it. For, for, for those that are sufferers, that have been through it, that, you know, maybe still going through it, the reality is you can actually get better, deal with it and, and start to, and learn to cope with it. Because it doesn't leave you, right? It doesn't leave you. I don't care what anyone says. It doesn't leave you. Once it's entrenched in you, it doesn't leave you. You you, you put up a, a stronger defence mechanism and you learn to deal and cope with it. You look for triggers and you know what those triggers mean and what, and what you need to do to react and all this sort of stuff. Um, and that's a challenge. But it's like with anything, you know, um, you just got to put in the work and the results and the rewards will come and they're worth it because being sad and depressed, it's no fun, mate. And when, and, and when it goes on for years and years and years and years, and you pretty much feel like you've got two personalities, because you know, I'm, I'm sort of clearly working at this point and, and had a um, professional career and, and, and a, a good career in the corporate world, et cetera. It's hard to actually manage that 
knowing yeah. that the, pretty much the minute you left the office or you get in the car and you go home, you're a different person. And I'd lock myself in, lounge, in the lounge room down the back and watch telly. Did that for years and years and years. Seems crazy, but it's a fact. And the kids, you know, the kids know that. Um, they didn't know why. They just thought I was a grumpy prick, um, to be honest. And, yeah, you know, they, it all makes sense to them now that, hey, you waste a bit of your life going through that sort of shit if you don't deal with it and deal with it properly. That there, mate, that's a really important message. I love hearing that. And as you know, it's nice now, whilst hindsight's a funny thing and you can look back in reflection, um, it's nice to hear you now speak more positively and, and understand it more so. You know, as we said, <clears throat> you can you can lose so much of your life and, mate, life is fucking short enough. So, oh, abs- and- yeah, you don't, yeah, exactly. You don't have to tell me that now, you know. It's just that's... It just it just revalidates um, the whole thinking process, you know, that you 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 learn and you use and you try to apply as as part of that whole dealing with uh, mental health. Let's talk about your your current situation with it, right? And one thing that really like really interests me is I think as human beings we're all so unique, right? There are certain similarities we all share in our characteristics and things we know are good for us. You know, we know exercise and we know eating healthy, all that stuff is good for the body. It's good for the mind. However, I'm always intrigued to know that um, every individual has their own anchors, right? The the little things that yep. keep you, you know, steady, they keep you in the right place mentally and physically. Do you have anchors every day or say weekly that? Uh, no, I don't, but I should. I'm more so now more than ever, you know, on the back of what's happened in the last three, four months, but I'm actually terrible. I mean, Sharon's probably my anchor, but she's sick of it in terms of trying to encourage me to be healthy and try and exercise and this sort of shit. I mean, yeah. she's 57 and she's got a rig like a bloody 20-year-old because yeah. she cares and works hard, right? Yeah. And, you know, she she's looked at me numerous times and said, you've just given up, haven't you? You've just given up. And she said, that's really unfair. It's selfish because at the end of the day, you won't live long if you continue to be as unhealthy as what you are, you know, some pretty sort of brutal facts, but yeah, well, you know, she's, she's only say, saying that for, for my benefit, you know, like, mm. but it's, it's, it's typically always been in one ear and out the other. I've, I've had different periods where I've attempted to deal with it. Actually, in fact, about, about seven, eight years ago, I lost about 20, 25, 26 kilos in three months. Yeah, and that was purely help. just that was through just eating well and swimming. Yeah. So, you know, and Sharon used that as an example to say, you know, you can do it if you want to do it, but you've got to put your mind to it. She said, you put your mind to so many other things and make sure that you actually are disciplined enough to do that. So why can't you do it with that? And it's a fair comment because, you know, I, I, there's no doubt that my reluctance and inability, inability to, to practice it consistently has probably, you know, contributed in some way, shape or form to the shit that I've just gone through with the whole um, prostate cancer side of things. No one will know. No one, no one ever really knows what causes that. But yeah, there's a bit of data and there's a bit of history that, you know, can link being unhealthy and overweight and this, that and the other to, to cancer. You know, I mean, there's links to cancer from stress and all that sort of shit. So sadly, I tick all the frigging boxes and it's my own mm-hmm. fault. Can we, can we dive into that a little bit there, right? The, the prostate cancer diagnosis. I can imagine that that for anyone, that is really hard to take. It's really hard to, to hear those words or negative words come out of a doctor's mouth that make you aware of your mortality, right? And do you respond differently to that having, a, having been through the mental health battles for 15 years? Like, is, is it harder to hear? Is it easier to hear? Like, talk me through that right. process. No, I think it's harder, and, and 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 I say that because it connects you back with your life, right? Because your life flashes before your eyes with that that call and those first discussions um, when diagnosed, and it's harder because you go, "Shit, am I about to die?" And and I know I've wasted so much of my life being depressed and sad. And I can't get that back. Yeah. So on that on that basis, I've I've found it uh, more difficult to deal with. I reflect every day on 
my whole life growing up right through to when the kids were young thinking what the stuff in hell have I missed out on and why can't I go back there and just do it differently mm. and I'm not the only person that says that and reflects like that but that's just that's what it's made me do at my age um having you know just had the the worst news anyone wants to get um as a starting point right as a starting yeah. point where, how far now are we, are we post that news? Four or five I had, months? Um, I'm, I'm 13 weeks since the operation and I pretty yeah. much from diagnosis. And I remember it because I'd had my normal blood test because, you know, this, this is the whole sort of um, reality of the last six or so months. You know, Sharon's sister died of cancer four Sorry years ago. And, you know, so we understand what cancer is all about. But I got a call in December, mid-December. Um, my mum had been a little bit unwell, but, you know, she lived forever, we thought, because her mum lived till 86, 87, was as tough as nails. And the doctor said, I've got some bad news for you. Your mum's got cancer. And that was the first time, you know, for some time that, you know, I, I'd sort of, it, it directly affected me because I wanted yeah. to know what it meant. And the cold heart reality is <clears throat> they said it, it was lungs, but they found spots in her liver and her spine. Yeah. And they said probably six to 12 months, but they don't know because the, um, the spots on the spine and once it gets to your bones can be um, very unpredictable and the consequence is not good. So sadly, she lasted seven weeks. And it was purely because of the, um, as I sort of predicted or, or wanted, or maybe aware of the, the 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 spine cancer actually was super aggressive, and it seven weeks she lasted. So, so this twenty sixth of January this year she died, and I would normally have my own tests every Feb for some reason around Febish, and I didn't have my just a regular health checkup, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I've been diligent with that, knowing that, you know, I'm not as diligent with the instruction that typically flowed from it around sugar and cholesterol. You know, it's a bit high, you need to do something. But jump around a bit here. As soon as I got my 50 year old bowel test, cancer bowel test in the mail, and you get it every two years after that, the minute I get it, I do it. So I, I'm, I'm sort of serious about this sort of shit. Yeah. But. I, I, for the life of me, did not expect to what with, to, with what's happened to play out um, the way that it did. So I, mum died and I, I went and got my test because I was feeling a bit shit anyway. And I just thought it was just, you know, mental challenging. And then as it turned out, the way I was feeling wasn't linked to what I was about to find out about anyway, but that was the driver for me to go and get it. And I'll never forget, it was the eve of, it was a, 18th of March and Dylan and I were going to do a, um, a premiere at uh, the Jam Factory um, yeah. of, a, of a new movie of a new movie that was coming out. All happy, buoyant. Dylan and I were just going out. We had the gold class to ourselves. We had to film some content. Let's just have a good night. And I had the test two weeks early and I'd only said to Sharon, believe it or not, the day before, I said, well, I haven't heard from the doctor. So I reckon I must be okay. I said, well, I haven't really been shit over the last, you know, two, three, four months. I haven't been eating that bad because I've been stressed about mum anyway and everything must be okay. Lo and behold, in the car that night, the doctor rang me and I knew as soon as I answered. And I said, um, okay, what is it? I thought everything was fine. Cholesterol or sugar? And he goes, Mark, don't worry about the cholesterol and sugar. He goes, your prostate, I need to see you tomorrow. And I just looked at Dylan and, and, and man, it was without even knowing anything other than, you know, it, it was a very, very elevated level um, of the PSA reading. My, my life started flashing before me at that point. And mm. it, it was just, it was, you could have knocked me over the feather basically. Man, I'm really sorry to hear that. And obviously it, it's, it's hard, mate. I can imagine the hardest thing would be telling the family and, and experiencing those emotions. And cause you're very tight with your family and I can tell you very tight with the family because the boys are a big part of your life. Your daughter's a big part of your life. You, you love your wife. You speak about your, your wife so highly. 
And, you know, you just got to go on your Instagram and the first thing you see is father of, husband of, you know, like, and to me that that strikes a chord because I'm very close with my family too. And I hear that, mate. And it it's really upsetting to hear because I know what that feels like when your health is uncertain and you have to share that experience with your family and they stress as much as you do. Talk me through the, the operation. What, what was the operation and of obviously removed something? Yeah, I think they took more than they should have taken. Just quietly. Yeah, okay. No, I'm joking. No, no, I'm not joking. I'm not joking. No, no. What? So, so I pretty much from the day, from that call that night, I went straight to the doctor the next day and I was lucky that, Urolo- um, my doctor, the GP, he has a visiting urologist and he happened okay. to be there that day. So he, so he was mapping out the, the what ifs based on that reading. You need to see um, a, a urologist, blah, blah, blah. So I, I waited and saw him that day. Um, he looked at the reading and then he did the old, um, the old digital test and straight away said, you've got um, lumps on your prostate that should not be there. And I went, then I, I went for an MRI. So I had all the next critical steps in that process done and dusted within three weeks. And that was an MRI to validate that there was an issue, which meant that there would need to be a biopsy where they go in and they took about 30 samples. Those samples then identified an aggressive um, prostate cancer that pretty much taken up the whole of the right-hand side on a Gleason berry from seven to nine, which is super bad. And went str- uh, PET scan to see if the PET scan um, identified any spread outside of the prostate. And at this point, based on that, um, the result there said no. Um, I then went straight in and, and had the prostate removed. All that happened within three weeks. Now, I know typically that can take three, four months, whether you're private. And, and, and sadly, uh, more often than not in public, it's way longer than that. But it was simple for me. The process had identified I had an aggressive cancer. And mm. I said to him, I don't want that in there for one second longer than it needs to be. And it was about shuffling a whole range of different things. And I said, I don't care. I want it out. And the schedule actually was looking like it might be, you know, four, six, eight weeks. And I said, no, this was the Thursday. Well, I had it out the following Tuesday. And and, oh, and wow. my and my surgeon was kind enough to listen to me. And I, I was probably a smart ass and I was pushy and all this shit, but it was about this is about my health and my life. Yeah. So what he actually did, he come in, he operated, his 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 operate, his book was full. He operated in the morning. And then he'd come back at 6.30 that night to operate especially on me because I just said, I'm, I'm not waiting. I'm just not waiting. I don't care. And so that was, and that was, I was blown away with that. It was really kind of him. You pay handsomely for it, but what price your life basically. Oh mate, and priceless. And that's obviously gone to plan thus far. And what does the process look like from here on out? Yep. Well, what it, so I, um, 13 weeks ago, I had that out and you have to wait for about six weeks for your first, um, I, I, I'll go back, sorry, the, the operation, um, they remove the prostate and, and the pathology, they, they do follow up pathology from that. And at this point, uh, the pathology identified, and again, thank you, you know, like that at that point, they believe it hadn't spread beyond the prostate. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it's, it's, it's about time now it's about time and managing um that time but the first blood test i had was six, after six weeks and that's um that's recorded it's basically zero psa level it was 0.00002 or something like that. it was undetectable was what he yeah. described it to me um and i took the call in a gold coast um shopping center and, and you know you're sitting there your brain's just being smashed from the operation with the recovery, the catheter in, out, how you're feeling, different things happening in your body. Had the blood test and I just sat waiting for a week to get the results and and he rang me and I'll never forget, I was in the shopping centre at Gold Coast and I just burst into tears. Oh, mate, I I can't blame you. I know know what it feels like just to get the good news, right? And, you know, he explained it that this is part of the journey and he didn't want to say that to be alarmist, but it's about, 
it, it, it's not just like, okay, you got prostate cancer, get it out, first test, three months, everything's fine. That's the way you hope it can, and I pray it mm. continues to play out that way with three monthly checks, et cetera. But it is about ongoing monitoring. And I've been so, so lucky to talk to so many people since I've been diagnosed and have them share their experiences with me around how they went, what happened, how did they get detected, when did they get detected, what's happened during the op, after the op, with, you know, all the things associated with it. And that's the, not just the physical, it's the mental side of things and everything. And some of them, some of them are between, you know, one and five years in and they still actually get tested between three and six months because that's just what you have to do. Yeah. Well, mate, I can imagine that getting that news and now having, I guess this, it's almost like another wake up call, isn't it? And I have this conversation with people all the time, right? How many wake up calls does it take for us personally to realize how important our health is? Now I've grown up with cystic fibrosis my whole life. My first 18 years, whilst it came with new diagnosis and like I had liver disease at nine and, and diabetes at 13 because of CF, but I was always really mentally and physically strong. They were diagnoses that we knew were likely going to happen because of the nature of cystic fibrosis. However, yep. my health was incredible because I worked really hard for it and I trained seven days a week. I was active, I ate well, I'd done all the right things. Then I hit 18. Most people start getting on the piss when they're 18, right? And getting on the party. For me, I was never going to be on the piss because liver disease saves you a few bucks at the yeah. bottom shop. Yeah. And yeah. My thing was a professional endeavor in the real estate space, as we spoke about before. I am a reformed real estate agent, for those who don't know. Was... I knew there was something I didn't like about you. And for me, like that, that professional <laughs> endeavor, it takes up your time and you start to put too much time into your work and you start to forget a little bit less about the fact that you are a living being and that this, is, this body is the one temple that you have, right? You have to look after it and then my problems started to happen and a few lung issues, then lung infections led to lung bleeds. And then you find yourself in a hospital bed going, okay, well, I'm going to get on top of my shit again. And you do for three months and then you don't. And then yep, for me, the catalyst, right. the catalyst was a moment last year where I had three bleeds in the lungs in three days and was the most aware of my cystic fibrosis that I've ever been. And I yep. was like, no, fuck this. I'm not just recovering for me this time. I'm going to go run a marathon and prove what's possible. And for me doing that five months later has changed my life. Like my health, I look at it in a very different way now. And I wake up every day with this immense appreciation. Every time I run, I say the same thing on my run when it's getting fucking tough, especially on the long ones. Towards the end, I say, blessed to be out here, blessed to be running, yeah. blessed to be healthy, blessed that my worst day would be someone's best and just like I remind myself that there are days where the things I now do I could not do and for me that was the wake-up call but I look back in reflection and, and to get back to my point before I digressed is I, I wondered why it took me so many wake-up calls yeah it's a good point and you know I look at how I've been to be honest since the whole thing and that was leading up to the op and post-op and I, I lost about 12 kilos leading up to the op and just after it and I, I, stress I got no doubt stressed and didn't feel mm. like eating and all this sort of shit so that was a really good start as far as what I needed to do in around change that I needed to make I haven't been as disciplined as I, uh, as I should be. Uh, and there's no excuses for it. Um, I've probably put four or yeah, probably put four of those kgs back on three, four, but I did, you know, so I, I do have myself to blame with some of that stuff. I'm, I'm taking so much, um, so many different things, supplements, um, shit, that people have recommended and suggested to me as part of the whole recovery and, and, and targeting and, and really focused on the potential microscopic spread that I've had confirmed actually is floating around in my body at levels that it shouldn't be at. So that should yeah. be enough of a wake up fucking call for me anyway, just purely based on that because that's, that's the, the frightening part of the, the unknown, basically, is yeah. when, when that could potentially 
seed and turn into something that, you know, may not be as operable as what this first surprise or scare has actually delivered. Um, but yeah, I, I did start swimming last week, believe it or not, when I lost all that, I've lost weight as seven, what, seven odd years ago. I started swimming last week and, and good to hear. got through five days and the first two and three were shit, right? And I've always liked swimming, but it's hard and you find excuses, but got through five days and then we go into this fucking lockdown. And there's way worse off than me. What I can't, I'm going to sit here and whinge because I can't swim. No, but it's just about, you know, fuck, you make a choice and, and, and you actually do that, that first step, which is often the hardest. And then this it shit is. happens. Way worse off than me. I understand it with this, all this COVID shit, but um, to be my luck at the moment, that's all. Mate, once you get out of lockdown, I'm going to be on your back because you're telling me you're moving to the sunny coast and, mate, there's no excuse to be swimming, not swimming up there. I'll um, be the only prick on the beach in a wetsuit. <laughs> <laughs> you, you sound like my old boy now. Um, mate, it's, it's really good to hear. I want to talk to you about how old are you now, Mark, if you don't mind me asking? 50, 53. 53. In 53 yep. years with the challenges you've faced, the things you've been through, being the father of three children, a husband and our grandfather, Talk to me about the lessons you've learned and, and the two or three that are probably the most prominent that you wish you knew uh, at, say, my age at 25. So I'd smell the roses. It would be my first bit of advice to anyone, and especially when it comes to family, right, and kids, because we're all too busy to do this, and I work long hours, and everyone works long hours. I understand that. But a lot of the, ki the kids growing up is a blur to me there's so much of it that I can't remember and that's because you know you leave home at 6 6 30 and get home at 6 6 30 and more often than not the kids are in bed or that close to bed didn't matter and I and when I got home it wasn't about um you know rushing to the kids it was it was selfishly probably about me hang on I've just had a busy day she hang on a sec wait for this no don't, don't go to bed I'll come and see you in a minute all this shit that's yeah. so my advice to anyone would be put your fucking kids first at that point to create the memories so you remember every step of them growing up. And, and I, what puts it in perspective for me is I used to travel a fair bit as well. There were times when I'd actually be getting home with a suitcase and the kids would look up. And this is from probably, you know, a when Dylan, Dylan was probably 10 or 11, whatever, but anyway, different points. Of, and they'd say, what, where have you been? I've been away for three days and they didn't even know. Yeah. And that's fair. And Sharon, Sharon would be the first to agree that. So, so because, you know, they're, they're used to mum managing the situation, the house and them and getting them from A to B and all this, because dad's working, they didn't even know I'd fucking been away for three days. Yeah. Now that's sad, I reckon. And yeah. it's a, more of a reflection on me than it is on them because they just go about their life and mum, mum's there for everything they need and they didn't know. Yeah. So I'm the one that was missing out and, and that just showed where your priority was. But, I mean, you've got to get money and, and all this shit to live and all this shit, but don't, re don't, don't, don't miss out on those moments of your kids growing up because you will live to regret it. What were you doing for a job? Like, what was your stuff in the corporate world? Oh, I was in packaging for about 10 years. And then I went to um, the other side of town to a company called City West Water, where I was um, in their commercial services area. Uh, then I worked in plastics for Nilex for five years and then worked in uh, for an American company, actually, in just in online data, believe it or not. So it was a real sort of left field career move and shift and change. I, I, I've sort of had four or five jobs. I've been really lucky. I've had amazing jobs that, you know, allowed us to, to do okay and put three kids through private school, et cetera. But I still know looking back that I could have balanced my, my work life and my investment in kids better, especially when they were younger. As I got older, it was different. Yeah, of course. Let's talk about the career transition because most people who are sitting here watching this or listening to this will know you 
from social media, from the angry dad stuff. And like I said, I, you know, I watched my fair shares worth of angry dad hours on Instagram and Facebook and, and laughed. And was that a real unlock? And I want to talk about the beginnings of that and where that comes from, but was that a real unlock to be doing the things you're doing now? Like, do you look at that and think little pricks, but fuck it opened up some opportunity. Yeah, it probably hasn't like, um, yes and no. Um, the reality is, the, the, the whole angry dad side of things, all it's done for me is validate from my own personal experience just how sad society is. And what I mean by that is that so many people are in desperate need of a laugh and how they get that laugh, um, mm. you know, fortunate these days because of how, how you can access content and, 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 and stuff to give you that laugh is the biggest eye-opener for me out of any of it it doesn't probably surprise me again because I can speak from experience but I've just been blown away with how many people actually are actually out there sad and just in a bad place that need to find ways to get them out of it and and, and I say this to everyone if at the end of the day when I'm no longer here that, I, that I've been able to help people get from a, a dark place to a positive place from the shit. So it's at my expense with the shit that the, the, the boys put me through, then uh, I can cope with that. I'm happy with that. Yeah, that's that's a really nice way of looking at it. And I think it it's almost fulfilling and feels like a bit of a privilege, right? That you can be the smile on somebody's face that day when things aren't going amazing. It's a reason I do this conversation and, and entertainment is powerful when it's, when it's done well. And whether that's, you know, I'm, I'm not really a funny guy. Um, I'd like to think I am around my mates and my family, <laughs> but on, on here, it's more so for me, like those inspiring messages and stories like your own. Um, however, the thing that you're doing, it's, it's a really good way of accessing just some sort of uplifting moment for somebody in their day. I'm nice to everyone, everyone, unless they yeah. give me a reason, not, and unless they give me a reason not to be. Yeah, it's, it's something as that. simple as that. It's, my, just, it, it's as simple as that. My old man, and he's always told me, and my pop sort of told him this. It was one of the key messages that he learned growing up was, you know, it doesn't hurt to be nice. It's, it's it not hard to be a good person. Yeah. Right. And it, it really isn't, especially in today's society. And, you know, I, I struggle in a time like this during lockdown because I'm the guy that, you know, that Facebook post that gets around, this is tag someone who greets the community. I'm the guy that gets fucking tagged in that every time because <laughs> I'm the guy that, you know, we all walk down here, like living on the beach in, in Wollongong is amazing. It's such a beautiful spot and everyone loves a walk down along the coast on the Blue Mile, we call it. And I'm the first bloke to, to be down there yelling out g'days and saying hello to everyone. And it's probably the one thing that I've reminded people to do, obviously, you know, be socially distanced and, and safe during these times, but it doesn't hurt to hurl a g'day at someone or, or a how you go. And it can be that little moment that uplifts somebody. And I know when I see people that, that mean something to me or friends or family or connections down the beach and they yell out and say, g'day, Brad, it's a nice feeling. It's nice to know that, that everyone's got everyone's back during these tougher times. So yeah, Mate, I could not agree with you more. Yeah. And to your point, as far as advice, um, one of the things that it took time that has helped me and I've, I've drilled it into my kids is the importance to understand disappointment versus regret. Yeah. Everyone has disappointment in their life. And typically, more often than not, you can't control that. But regret, you can Mate, regret typically driven, regret. I like that. That's a really well, good Well, regret typically dri is driven by decisions you've made. That you've, they're the wrong decisions, right? And we all make the wrong decisions. Again, I get that. So, um, yeah, without drilling down too far, if you look at it very simplistically and high level, disappointment versus regret. Except disappointment, we all get it. Regret is about decisions that you could have made that were different that would have prevented a situation and you regret it. it what why, why, if you distinguish them, right? Yeah. Dealing with disappointment is way, way easier than dealing with regret. So you, 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 can, you can make up yourself what your, your life's about, full of disappointment or it's full of regret or a combination of both. But the less regret you've got in your life, I think the easier it is to actually accept yourself and, and you know, and move on. 
It's funny you bring that up, right? Because I think, I think that's an incredible point. And that strikes a tone with me at the moment because I had a conversation with, with a few of my friends and my family the other day. So my current, something that I've been sort of working through at the moment is I've been out of a professional career for 18 months now. So I left real estate back in April, 2020. And the reason I left real estate was I fucking hated getting up in the morning and going to work. I just, I just had it. You know what I mean? I was fucking over it. Like as someone who is always happy and always out of his shell and trying to make the best out of every day, like I'm, I'm a really positive guy and everyone who knows me knows that, that part of my character. I'm that annoying yep. prick at fucking five 30 in the morning. Who's got too much energy. That's me. So when I was, well, is that because you, you're just getting home from a bender or something? <laughs> <laughs> not quite, not quite, but it's um like, that's me. And like, to feel myself hate and getting out of bed to go to work in the morning. I was like, I need to change something I do. And I worked with really good people. So like my, my office environment and the people around me were fantastic and my clients were amazing and I still have great relationships with all of them. So for me, I knew it was something that I needed to go and go and chase and pursue what I really yeah. loved. And that's why I lent into this, into conversation, into storytelling. But I, I went through tougher times financially last year and I've got incredible family who wanted to support me, but I, you know, yep. thankfully denied that because I think it's, it's really important to own your circumstances and, and take responsibility of the actions that you take and the decisions you make. And for me, I sold my house. So I owned a little property, a little apartment that I bought just before the market boomed, thankfully. And yep. I was able to sell it and, and get some money out of that. That was got to be my ticket to actually continue pursuing what I love and it sort of hit me and I sold that three months ago four months ago now and um you, you tend to get a little bit comfortable when you when you're not broke anymore right when you're not fighting for yeah of course you know, the yeah. next paycheck and I sat there in, in reflection and I kind of looked at at what I've been doing the last couple of months and maybe whether I've been pushing myself enough and I'm like you know what I feel like I know what my purpose is in this world it's to to tell story and, and have positive impact in people's lives. But I don't know if I figured out exactly what the vehicle is yet. Right. So podcast is one of those. It's a great way to connect and share um, whether that be standing on stage, writing, speaking to people face to face. I don't know what it is and I need to keep testing and trying, but yeah. that thought of regret that, why the fuck did you sell your house? You sold it to buy yourself a ticket to pursue your dreams, right? If you were going to fucking have a crack, you need to have a crack because don't sell your house to afford and be comfortable with going to brekkie and going to lunch and going to dinner and wasting your money on bullshit. That doesn't matter. You sold it. No, but at the end of the day, share. what I would say to that is it's making you happy, right? So yeah. you'll ultimately, you'll ultimately look back and, and critique that decision down the, part of the track and say it was the best thing I've ever done or nah, maybe I could have done it um, differently. However, you're still ticking the box about, being happy and wanting to bounce out of bed every day, doing something that you love. And it might not materially reward you at this point, but who knows what tomorrow brings. And that's that old cliche, find, find, find something you love and you'll never work another day in your life. So you're doing something about it, right? What happens is too many people don't do anything about it. And I'm guilty of that. So the fact that you've actually had the balls to do something about it. And yes, you're lucky. You've got assets to sell to actually keep you afloat while you fulfill your dream and find what it is that you want to do. I'm all for that shit. That's, if 100%. it doesn't work, that, that, that for me would sit in a disappointment box, not the regret box. And that's the point I was getting to is, is for me, that's that feeling. I want to make sure that if at the end of this, it doesn't work and it didn't turn out to be what I wanted it to be. It is disappointment and it's not regret of fully having had a go. And yeah. I think that's been the lesson for me in the last couple of weeks, the last month is never stop trying, you know, never stop no. trying, never stop testing, never stop tasting what the right thing could be or what the, the right ingredient is in the mix. And that's why I think that point that you made there, regret versus disappointment is, is maybe the key takeaway from this podcast here for everyone, because as we've learned here today, life is fucking short and you've really got to make the most of it and have a crack. Absolutely. And if you're unhappy throughout most of it, you can be, you, you can be as rich as you like before you put a toe in the grave and it doesn't make any sense. You can't take it with you. Bloody and, oath. And, and you don't get a second crack at it. You just don't. You, you just don't. You do not. And 
Matt, I, I sort of want to, I want to ask you a question because there's one part of you that I haven't really researched too much yet. Um, but I've seen it pop up in discussion um, when you've been talking on other podcasts or shows or interviews. Banter. What's banter? Well, it was a group messaging app that we actually built. Um, we did two versions of it. And sadly, it's no longer. It just needed so much cash to keep it going to try and compete with the WhatsApps and the messengers and this, that, that are well and truly established and entrenched that we just made a, um, a business decision basically just to, to shelve it. We had to. And even though the second the second version was way better than the first because we had inbuilt gamification and all this shit, you know, we thought we had um, something that was super unique and, and, and there was a, a, a market for, but it's just one of those it's those one of those things you try it and it didn't work and you move on but it was a cracking product it was an absolutely cracking product and it's well like you said it's going to land in that disappointment category isn't it you had a crack yeah yeah well you know like sometimes you got to do things three four five ten twenty times before you get something to stick um and that's just one of those examples. Well, we, we had something like, when we launched the first version, we had 60, 60 or 70,000 downloads within hours. Yeah, wow. Now, you know, these, these global social media platforms have tens and hundreds of millions, but the reality is that we, we felt that was actually an amazing start. And then there's a, a number of things happened and... You know, we then did version two, but then made a business decision that you can't keep throwing cash at it because we become clearer to us that it needed way, way, way more funds than we believe we would be able to attract via any sort of capital raising, seed angel, whatever, it doesn't matter. So we just decided to move on. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. It was um was a question I had because I couldn't find much information on it. So that probably yeah, makes, no, it, makes sense now. It went crazy. It went crazy and then it stopped and it's just another. I mean, I, I, I did, geez, what's this, uh, about eight years ago? No, six, about nine years ago, I think it was, 2013. I'd actually built, that was my first little foray into becoming an entrepreneur. I built a um, an app called Newsbid, which was about... Um, sharing and selling content you know every smartphone user is basically a um an on-the-spot photographer and journalist for media companies right and they all yep. they buy great content because they need it they're dependent on it now they don't have journalists and photographers they've got rid of all them and it's all third third party access and this sort of stuff so yeah that was the first thing i built and i thought that was going to change the world um sadly Again, it was going to require way too much money. Yeah. And the education process to, 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 to educate people to when they capture content that is newsworthy to actually facilitate it through a, an app like Newsbid where they can earn money for it is what they need to do rather than just upload it. Once it's uploaded, the monetary value is basically yeah, way, way, way less because it's, it's in the public domain then. Whereas if you've got exclusive content that has a value then wow you know who knows and that's been the case for years and years and years where you know paparazzi and the like have captured amazing content and sold it for six and seven figure sums but so that that's what news did was all about but i i um i closed that one as well but i can't say i haven't kept having a crack that's and that's what i like doing i'm a bit of a hustler and i'm a, I'm, I'm a, a deep thinker and i'm always looking for you know, a, a solution to a, um, a problem that's out there that exists. I love to hear it, mate. That's exciting. And, and no doubt, um, eventually the right app will happen, but you're having much success in your life now. And, and probably the biggest success is that family and those grandkids and mate, I'm, I'm wishing you or, you know, as, as much well wishes as I can with this journey moving forward with your health, but also with your family and, Man, I'm looking forward to seeing you getting around the, the sunny coast and, and enjoying the lifestyle that Queensland has to offer with your family nearby. Yeah, can't wait for it myself. Um, Sharon and Hannah the, are there. Um, I'm still here and, tra and we'll transition once house sells. Um, uh, I don't know if that's a month or two or three or six, but it is what it is. And at least we've put our toe in the water 
we've started the process and now it's just the, the only unknown is the time frame so um i want to get get up there and get some vitamin d and just feel happier and healthier and i don't know you're stuck in melbourne here it's miserable i've loved melbourne never thought i would actually ever leave but it's time it's time for a change and you know i'm going to do shit now that's about me and not about pleasing every other bastard Mate, I love to hear it. Hey, I want to get an iconic sign off here. There's there's something that we've heard many many times throughout your <laughs> content. The old the old fuck off Mitchell. Um, yeah. to, to close us off here today, if you could give us a fuck off, Brad, that would be amazing. Uh, I, I I was I thought you were going to say it about Mitch. I was going to say it's easy for me to do. If you happen to walk in this door now, I would say fuck off, Mitchell. You know, like I don't want to hear. He's annoying, yeah. right? But you know, and a great to chat to you, Brad, and. Um, Good luck to the all. Now, Brad, you know what? Fuck off, Brad. <laughs> You're a legend. Thank you so much. Cheers, mate. Nice to talk to you. Good to talk.